Um, <laughs> as, as I said, my name is Notokwam Maskom Antokan, which means old woman bear sitting next to the crater, and I'm from the bear clan. I'm, I am originally, I was born a Cree, <laughs> but I married into the blood tribe in southern Alberta, so I'm also Kainai, uh, because my son is a Kainai, who says that he's a real Indian and Crees are not, so tells you, tells you how much brainwashing occurred down with him. Anyway, um, the workshop that I wanted to do this afternoon relates to our inherent rights and who we are, and how, what the state of Canada is doing in relation to undermining those rights, and how they're using our own people to do that. Because I think people need to know what the agenda of Canada is, so that you can plan on what's, going, what's happening within your own territory, because each nation is under attack. It's not an isolated, someplace else, someone else is doing this. It's each nation is under attack. And education is a very good example of how the government of Canada has been using a little by little by little by little to give, get us to give up our inherent right to education. And what they started goes back to, I mean, even before uh, we were actually out of, out of school, in, nine, in the 1900s, they started with the residential schools. And the residential schools were really a mechanism that the state of Canada implemented to separate children from their families for the specific purpose of the children forgetting who they are, forgetting the history, forgetting their, their, who their clans are. Most, a lot of our people, I mean a lot of our people, do not remember, know who their clans, what their clans are. They don't know what the clan belong to. Because in the education system, that was taken away. And so they don't know what they, what they are. And that process is designed to separate us from our land and our territory. And so when we came here, you know, we've always been here in Turtle Island. When we came here, and we've lived on Turtle Island because I have the idea that we have, I mean, uh, you might have a different style of, style of uh, construction of a house, but we had teepees, and there's 13 poles, and each one of them means something. But we're not going to talk about that now. So we had our land. We had our territory, we had our own laws, we had our own history, we had our own, our own language, and our language relates to our territory. Because that was one of the first things they did, is they separated the children from the language and then from the territory, because they introduced <clears throat> non-Indigenous terms like I don't know, Sault Ste. Marie probably is not an indigenous term. Um, I don't know that, I'm not that familiar with the area, but I don't know if this is a traditional name for this area. Hmm? See, they, th it's a different name, isn't it? So what they've done is they've imposed their names on our land. And in doing that, they, they, they separated the spiritual aspect of what those names mean from our children through, this, through the education system. So, so our education system of how we trained our children um, and our own health care related to how our, our plants and herbs. Um, and so all these things we had, what you call an inherent right. These are the rights that we were born with. When we came here, when we were born here in Turtle Island, we come with these rights. So these are the, what we call inherent rights. And what happened was over here across the big water was the crown, or the, the non-indigenous peoples represented by the crown. Now, over there, they passed a law 
It's called 1763 Royal Proclamation. Sorry to give you all this history, but because it's kind of important. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 said that these people cannot come into our territory without a treaty. That's one thing. The second thing it says, if they're in our territory without a treaty, the Crown has an obligation to remove these people from our lands. The other thing that's very important to know about the Royal Proclamation is this, that the treaties will be made if the Indians so desire. And this is a very important phrase in the Royal Proclamation because that means that the, tr the treaty making process was within the hands of our ancestors. So they could come and want to make a treaty, but it was up to our peoples as to whether or not the treaties were being made. And so if you look around your territories and you'll s to where the treaties were made, the treaties were not made in London, England. They were not made in Ottawa or Toronto, maybe some were, but that's before, before those were big places. For the most part, the Crown's representatives came to our people where our people were. And they, and they made an agreement with us to enter into our, to, to be in our territory. And that's the treaty, the treaty relationship. It is this relationship, they said, that they wanted to live in peace amongst us. And in return for that living in peace, that there were certain benefits that we would receive forever, as long as that treaty was there, which we call today, we refer to as treaty rights. Inherent rights and treaty rights are not the same thing. So don't get those two confused and think, I have an inherent treaty right. No, you have inherent rights and you have a treaty right. Those are two separate issues. So when they created this treaty relationship, they, the crowns said that, they would that we would receive certain benefits, and one of them related to education. Now, what happened was underneath over here, the crown created something called Canada. And that was through an act of the British Parliament in, in, called the BNA Act in 1867. And they also created provinces. So this creation of Canada, we didn't make treaties with Canada. We made treaties with the Crown, and this is very important because Canada is what they call a successor state in international law. They inherited the obligations. Because you have to know this because of what Canada is doing now in relation to the treaties. So they created this little entity called Canada, wait, not even near here, it was way down over there. So I don't know which way am I looking. Which way is the hotel facing? This way, if we're sitting this way, which way are we looking? Do you know, east, west, north, south? We're looking south? Okay, looking south? Okay. So over there then to the east. <laughs> I just wanna make sure, you know. <laughs> One time I was in New Zealand and I was talking and I was, pointing that way and pointing this way and and because uh, I was looking at the sun and this lady said, excuse me, I thought, in, you know, indigenous people from across the water always look to the east first. And I said, exactly, that's what I'm, that's where I'm looking toward. And she said, no, you're looking west. <laughs> she said, because when you're looking at the south, you're looking north. Or, you're looking north, yeah. So I was looking north, that was the west. Anyway, I was all confused. Anyway, so... Way down, you know, down east, there was what they called this little place called Canada. Over the years, Canada's expanded. But from the time, uh, from, 18, from the 1800s on, 1880s onwards, Canada started implementing a policy to try to drag, and I use that word drag, drag the inherent right of education underneath the provinces. And how have they done that? That's what I want to talk about today. Because I think it's very important to know this, how they've done that step by step. And I said one time, it was just like how they put a frog in cold water. And so the frog is quite happy there, and he's quite content. 
and then they start turning up the heat. And by the time the frog realizes it's boiling hot, he's gone. And that's sort of what they've been doing to us. So the education system was used to try to educate our children away from this process, away from the history of our land, the history of our people, our own legal system, our own languages, our own, uh, our own inherent authority, and they tried to move us over here. There was a tremendous backlash from the, from the nations when, in 1969, Canada int introduced what they call the white paper. And this was introduced by Trudeau and Chrétien. And what was the purpose of the white paper? If you read the white paper, and you should, I, should, I recommend everybody should read it, because in 1969 white paper, what it said is there will only be one deliverer of services. One deliverer of services. And that's not, the, that's not the nations. The one deliverer of services is the government is saying the provinces. And what happened in 1969 is that the people rose up across the country and they, and they put forward a paper called the Red Paper, Citizens Plus, it said, that in addition to being a citizen of Canada, we had all of these rights, our inherent rights, which they call Citizens Plus. And there was a huge backlash in Canada. And Canada said, yes, Trudeau said, well, we will not implement this paper until you, get, you agree. That's what he said. But what they did, and, and we kind of fell down on this part of it, what, we, what they did is they said we, they stepped back, but they always had the idea that they would implement. But in, in 1970, when the red paper was introduced, the first thing that the elders and the leaders at that time focused in on was what? Education. Indian control of edu Indian education. Anybody remember that document? Indian control of Indian education? No? Yeah, some people do remember that. In, they said Indian control of Indian education. And what did Indian control of Indian education mean? It meant teaching our children in this model. And so they said, we have to start having our own institutions. And so in Saskatchewan, where I was born, they had the Cultural College of Saskatchewan, Indian uh, Cultural College, which was this, supposed to develop materials that would teach this information. And I think there was one in British Columbia. I don't know if there was one in Ontario that was developed. Uh, but so they started talking about developing curriculum, developing schools on models that were based on this part of the inherent right. Canada saw this as a real problem. And so what they did is they said, they didn't say it was a problem. What they said is that you guys have got a great idea. What we need to do is have Indian certified teachers. And so then they started the ITEP programs, Indian Teachers Education Program, right? Anybody remember those programs? Indian Teachers Education Program. So you then could go to school and get a certificate that said that you could be a, an assistant in the school because you then could deal with things like language and history with the students. So they said, well, let's have the ITEP program. So I think across the country, I don't know how many places they set up the ITEP program. So people started getting into ITEP. And then they said, well, maybe what you should do is have a, a degree program in an in, in education degree. So they encouraged some institutions, they funded them, to provide in, in, an in, in education degree. I know the University of British Columbia, the University of Saskatchewan, they started coming up with these Indian education teach programs. So once they started training education teachers, and they started saying, okay, well then you, you know, you're educated, you got your degrees, but where is the certificate of being a teacher being, being authorized? Is it being accredited over here, or is it being accredited over here? Your, your diploma, your certificate was being accredited over there. 
under the province. And then they sent these teachers into the communities and said, you should be teaching in your, in your communities. We support that. But at the same time, they started talking about, and I remember the first time they did this at our community, they said, you should have an uh, education board. An education board. And, and our people were saying, why do we need an education board? And they said, well, the town people have education board. You should have an education board. And an education board will be, you know, be helpful to the teachers that are working in your school. You know, they'll just be there to help them. So people said, oh, OK, education board. OK, let's, let's. People didn't even know how to sit on an education board. We didn't even know what an education board was. So he said, I'm appointed to the education board. OK, what am we doing here? Education board. We didn't, you know, nobody really knew what that was. And they said, well, you're supposed to help the teachers. And they said, OK, well, let's help the teachers to teach, teach this over here. And the teachers go, oh, no, no, we can't teach this. We've got to teach, we got to teach the curriculum, the provincial curriculum. Well, let's try to change the provincial curriculum to teach more about this, you know. And that never really happened. Because if you go into, and I was just at a school not too long ago, high school students, they have their own school, beautiful school, great school, a really fantastic school, a lot of Indian art on the, on the walls, you know, lots of sayings in the hallways, all this sort of stuff. It looks pretty fancy. I said to the students, what year did your ancestors make treaty? What year did the ancestors make treaty for you so you could have this big building? They didn't know. I said, who's the chief that made the treaty for your people? They didn't know. I said, where did they make the treaty? They didn't know. I said, just down the road from here, like just, just down there. And they said, oh, they gave me, a, gave me a name of a town. And I said, uh, no, it wasn't that town. It wasn't in the town. So you might have a very nice building with all the pretty artwork on the walls, but the students are not learning this. They're not learning this at all. They're learning everything that's coming from over here. And so what they have, what they have done is they have incorporated themselves into your, into your nations over here where now people think that what they're teaching over here is the education. You know, and, I, and I'll tell you something. When I was in school, I was in residential school, and then I went to a high school outside the reserve. And I was told that if I spoke my language, I wouldn't do well at university. It was quite a, quite a prevalent thing, being told. And then I started working in the United Nations in, in, uh, in the late 70s in Geneva. And most of the people that I met and worked with over there speak four or five languages fluently. Fluently. I could be having a conversation with somebody in English. That same person will be having a conversation with three other people in three different languages. And I was, I was completely knocked over by it. And this woman that I was asking about this, her original language was German, which she learned until she was about grade seven. And then they introduced French, and then they introduced Italian and Spanish and English. She actually spoke five languages fluently, read, wrote and read in, in all five. And why is it they tell our people that you cannot learn our indigenous language and be successful? Because they have a plan to introduce into, into the schools, which does not include remembering this part of it. Because if we forget this part of it, then we'll just remember only this part. And our children will not know the history, will not know the laws, will not know their territory. And this is what they're really after, is our land. That's what they really want, is the land. So, this Indian control of Indian education that we had, they put out, is a very nice book, 1972, Indian Control of Indian Education. And I'm being a little bit harsh, but I think it's true. The only thing Indian control of Indian education has gotten us is we can hire our own janitors. That's all I think Indian control of Indian education means. Because everything else is under their model. 
Like if you have a if you have a school immersion school, most of your students in an immersion school from grade one, three, four, five, six, whatever, will not pass the provincial tests. Those uh, what do they call them? Um, they have a test at the end of grade three. Right. They won't pass because the children are not speaking and reading in English. They're, they're speaking and reading in their indigenous language. So they don't pass the provincial curriculum. So then your school takes a nosedive on, on, the, on the criteria set by the province, saying that it doesn't meet the standard. And it's even more if you go, if you go on and you have the total immersion into grade six. Up to grade six, the, the, the results go even further down. Although these children will be able to tell you everything over here and have an incredible ability to, to deal with the world and, and the world around them, they just don't know anything about over here. And so this, then you have teachers, I think if you're a teacher, my, sis, my late sister was a teacher. She is telling me that when she was getting out of, out of uh, university, the first thing they did to her was they said, well, you know, you need to meet these provincial standards because you had to do some, some kind of practicum or something. I'm not sure exactly what, what the whole deal was there. But she said it's the standards that are set not by our own people but by the province. And when she was working in Cree, in Cree curriculum development, that the, the biggest people, the biggest hurdle she had was in the school with the teachers that were teaching because the teachers did not want to change the curriculum because they were afraid that their students would not meet the provincial criteria. And so then they, they didn't want to change to teach this part of it because they were afraid that they would not succeed. And so rather than thinking about how can our schools be supported in developing a standard that would support them so that they can, if they want to enter post-secondary institutions outside of their communities. How can we support them to do that? The teachers turned on, on the curriculum development specialists and said, you can't do this because this is you know, not gonna create positive role models. But, the, but I, what I see, looking at it, is that our children are not staying in school. And why aren't our children staying in school? My thinking is that they know there's something wrong. They can't articulate it, but they know there's something wrong. And if you can connect with them on this side, the inherent rights side, you can keep them in a school system. That's what I've seen. Because I see in Onion Lake in Saskatchewan, they have a uh, Cree uh, school only. Uh, they don't, they're, they're self-funded, they don't take any provincial monies. But they have Cree curriculum for their children. And these children, now they're young, you know, going into adulthood, have a totally different view of the world and their place in the world. It's really, it's really going back to the inherent authority that we had as indigenous peoples. And it's a very brave step by the leadership there, but it's not the leadership that drove, drove this. It was the elders. Because the elders there saw that if you don't do something to teach these children the language and the songs and all of the ceremonies, in the future, there won't be anybody to do them. And we have a spiritual relationship with our land. And if we don't keep up that spiritual relationship, we're going to lose it. You know how they say, if you don't use it, you'll lose it? So our children, we have to turn, turn it back so that they can find a productive place in this, in this inherent rights uh, model. Because in this, school, in this model over here, when you develop school boards, and you have a school board modeled on the province, most of it is incorporated. Because what's the other federal government initiative is that you have a school board, and the school board is sometimes incorporated under the province, incorporated, 
and the federal government has encouraged the contribution agreements on education to be signed by these school boards. These school boards incorporated under the province and these contribution agreements have no relationship to this. They have no relationship to the treaty because a provincially incorporated school board is not incorporated under the inherent laws of our people. It's in incorporated under the provincial laws. So you start signing all these agreements with this incorporated body. There's no connection between this body and the treaty relationship. So it's easy for the federal government then to start cutting slash burn because these agreements, if you read them, they talk about policies and programs, not legal obligations, which are treaties. And I have sat in meetings and I've listened to Indian Affairs saying to these, you know, these people saying, well, you know, if you start talking about legal obligations and it becomes political, and once it's political, it got bogged down, and we can't really flow the funding, and we got all kinds of problems, and you know, so like if we just make this agreement and we'll make it flow, and people go, oh, okay, well, okay, let's just cut out the chief and council then, or the leadership, and let's just flow the monies through the schools. But when you, when you allow an education right to be downgraded and discussed as a policy and a program, you then give the authority to the government to slash and burn. You do. So Indian control of in education, as I said, is only gives you the permission to hire the janitor. Because your, the policies and programs that you're operating are not yours. They belong to the government and the province. And remember, 1969 white paper, Trudeau and Chrétien said, there will only be one service deliverer. One service deliverer is the province, it's not your nations. And what they have done since 69 is that little by little by little by little, they have moved you over here. They have moved this education right over here. So when in, yet, you know, they're talking just before the break, the lunch break or whatever they call it, coffee break. Tim Thompson was talking about national education. This act, it says First Nations jurisdiction over education in British Columbia. That's, the, that's what it says on the cover page. But if you read the inside and it says, this is what the name of the act really is. It says, an act to provide for jurisdiction over education on First Nation lands in British Columbia. It doesn't say that on the, on the front of this cover. It doesn't say anything about the land on this cover. But the actual name of this says, on the lands, on First Nation lands in British Columbia. And as I was saying over there in the meeting, there was a big meeting here in, I mean, in Ontario, I'm talking about, in October 2011. No, 20, what, the, what year is this? <laughs> 2013, 2012. There was a big meeting in, Ontario, in uh, Ottawa, uh, actually in Hull, or Gatineau now. And it was a very ugly meeting. Um, and they were trying to get a resolution through that supported national education legislation. And the, there was a lot of people there from treaty areas that were saying no, no. And there was, it was a very nasty fight. Um, but if you read the legislation, and it says here, you're going to create a provincial uh, education uh, board or authority. Uh, 
and the authority is going to have the capacity, rights, and powers, and privileges of a natu natural person, which means an incorporation, or a corporation modeled under here, can enter into contracts, hold, acquire, and dispose of property or interests in a property, to raise, invest, or borrow money, and to sue or be sued. So they have really removed education from over here and moved it totally over here, completely. The other thing that this thing says um, is that this authority, that's the education authority, shall, uh, by co-management, that's with the province, establish standards that are applicable to education provided by participating First Nations on First Nation land for curriculum and examinations of the course necessary for graduation. So then, so two, that's 2A, or 192A, and then three says, the authority shall consult with the competent authorities in British Columbia regarding standards established under paragraph 2A. So your curriculum and examinations for courses necessary for graduation will be under the competent authorities of British Columbia. So where in that, in this scenario, does it recognize your inherent authority? Because what's happened here in British Columbia, I don't know if you know, there's a, there's a problem with this. Well, the Indians say there's a problem, and I'll tell you why. This, was, this came into existence in 2006. This is an act of Canada. So they, in British Columbia, they moved education over here underneath the province. And guess what? The federal government is not giving him any money to implement, they, they think, to implement the agreement. But whatever they thought they were getting in British Columbia through this process was not to implement anything except to put them clearly underneath the provinces. So as far as the federal government is concerned, they have achieved what they wanted from 1969. There'll be one service deliverer, and that's the province. There will be no funding to the First Nations for education. The federal government is not going to fund it because once they have gotten you to agree to give it up, give up your inherent authority on education and move into the provincial model, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished because that's what they said in 1969, one service deliverer. And it's not our First Nations. Because you can see in the post-secondary education what they did when I went to university, way back in the dark ages, I was one of the, probably the first Indians to go to university. I went to university in 1970. I would tell you I was a child prodigy, but I wasn't. <laughs> I went to university, and in the mid, like 1970, 76, after I had, I had a degree in, I have a bachelor of, uh, arts in Indian, Indian history. I have a master's in arts in Indian history, and then I got accepted to go to law school. And in, because at that time, Indian Affairs funded everything, right? So they said, Indian Affairs says to me, we're not going to fund you to go to law school. Because the guy says, the guidance counselor says to me, you're educated enough. That's what he told me. He says, you're educated enough, you don't need to go to law school. And I said, I have a treaty right to education. And so I said, if you don't provide funding for me to go to university, to law school, I'm going to go to the press. Because I'm the first Indian accepted into law school, and I'm a woman, and you're not funding me to go to university after you say that you want Indians to be educated. I said, it's going to make a great story. <laughs> anyway, they, they agreed to fund me, OK? So I gave my tuition, they paid my books, and I used to get $316 a month to go to school. And I was going to school in Victoria, so 
I had to pay $125 out of the 316 for rent and then bus pass and all sort of stuff. But what they did is they never, you know, because it's now an Indian Affairs Fund to check, you know, they, they, they send my check like the middle of the month and all that sort of stuff. When you have to pay the rent at the beginning of the month. So coming up towards Christmas time, they hadn't sent me my check. And so I'm trying to study and I'm trying to do this. And finally, I just realized I, I, I can't continue. I've got to drop out. Because my parents could not support me at university because they had a lot of other children at home and uh, they just couldn't do it. And so I went to the dean and I said, I'm dropping out of law school. And he said, what? Why are you dropping out of law school? So I told him the story about being funded by Indian Affairs and what they were doing to me and all this stuff, that they weren't sending my check on time, like the middle of the month. And uh, so the dean, bless his heart, he said to me, on the 30th or the 31st of every month, you come to my office, my secretary, she will have a check for you for the rent. You take the check, you cash it, you pay the rent, and when you get your check, you pay us back. So for two and a half years, that's how I went to law school. He funded me to pay the rent for my, so I wouldn't get kicked out of my apartment. But because Indian Affairs were funding it, they were trying to, pro to, to, to limit the number of people. And in my First Nation, I, I got up in a meeting and I said, no, don't do that. Do not take on the funding of our post-secondary education because if you do, Indian Affairs in the future is going to cut us. And a couple of my cousins said, well, you know, that's good for you to talk because you got a law degree, you don't need, you know, you don't need a job. We, we need jobs and we can do this. And I said, well, I'm just saying in the future they're going to cut it. Because you have to look at what they did in the United States. In the United States, in the early 60s, they did the same thing with the BIA. They transferred all this money to the, to the First Nations or the nations there for post-secondary education. And in Rocky Boy, Montana, which is just south of uh, Alberta there in, in Montana, in 1986, this is 26 years after they had transferred this money to them, they were getting 25000 a year for post-secondary education. And all that Rocky Boy could do was to monitor, they only had a woman working half time, and all she could do is phone up the students to find out where they are and try to find money to help them go to school. She would help them write grant applications or loan applications or whatever. And that was in 1986, and I, and I, and I knew about this. And I said to the nation, don't do it. Well, people went into post-secondary education, they started administering it, and it became a program rather than your right, rather than a legal right under the treaty. And so then they cut, they cut, and they cut. So we need to reverse that. This is a very tough boat to turn around, you know, so to speak. But I think it can be done because we still have this treaty relationship. And how are we going to do that? I think that's, that's the, you know, they said over there that's a challenge. I don't think national legislation is the answer. Actually, I don't think legislation at all is the answer. Sorry to say that. Because our people are over here, and any kind of legislation always involves us complying with either Canada or the province's criteria. Because if you look at this legislation that was passed in British Columbia, uh, I don't know, maybe they can get a copy of us for you to take away from, from here with you. Um, it says in here that uh, the... Um, They will get you to make a law, but this law has no force. What does it say here? Oh, yeah. Section 28, it says, For greater certainty, First Nation laws are not statutory instruments within the meaning of the Statutory Instruments Act, which is under the Canadian 
legal system. So even if you pass a law, it's not going to have the force and effect of being over here. So I think you have to rethink the whole process of how you're going to do that. I hate to use paper, but I think what you need to do is this. This is just a suggestion. You don't need to take it up. What we need to do, and I think that a lot of people have done a lot of thinking on this. I'm not, I don't think I'm new on this. So you've been thinking about it a lot. Is that we need to somehow create a mechanism. We might already have it. Um, that says our education, I can't even spell education, education. authority, you know what I'm getting at. When I went to university in 1970, I had been passed out of the white system, reading at a grade three level, writing at a grade two level, and I couldn't spell worth nothing. But the reason they got me out of school was because I used to talk a lot. Uh, and ask a lot of questions, so they thought, let's graduate this one and get her out of here. <laughs> uh, I spent a whole year learning how to read when I was at university. I, I didn't know how to read anything. I, I couldn't even read a book. I, I couldn't write a sentence. I didn't even know how to construct a sentence or an essay. I remember sitting in, in the, the, the person's office that was, that was uh, my so-called... Uh, uh, teacher that was teaching me how to read and write. I was 20 years old. He was teaching me how to read and write. And I remember sitting there, he was asking me to write an essay one, or write a paragraph one time. He said, try to write a paragraph. And I said to him, okay, show me how you do it and I'll watch you. And he said, what? I said, just show me how you write a paragraph and I'll just watch you. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, we always, you know, watch people doing things and so from watching you all see how to do a paragraph. And he said, that's not how it's done. And I said, okay, that's not how it's done, but how do you do it? I didn't, I couldn't understand how to learn in that system. Like, how do you do things like that? Anyway, so I think um, what we need to do is we have our own way of doing things. And they're very strong, and I think we need to build on that. So there needs to be some kind of, um, mechanism that we can say, this is the standard at which we want to meet. This is what we want our children to be able, and our young people to be able to do. And, and the hell with the other side, because the other side is gonna come to us, I think, because they got problems already on the other side. You know, and the, other, the other system has a problem already anyway. So we need to develop our own education authorities, but the most important thing, is the implementation of treaty. And what does the implementation of treaty mean? It means that they're using our territories and every day they're making money off our territory. Right? Canada is fifth in the world because of our territories and our resources. But when you add, when you add us into it, it drops down to 67, Canada. So our, my thinking is that what we need to do is find a way, and I've talked about this, is find a way to get access to our resource revenue. They're making everyday money from our territory. And so from that, we should receive sufficient funds that we can earmark for what we need to earmark them for, whether it be education, health, or whatever, housing, whatever it is. But we make those decisions, not based on anybody's policies or programs, but actually on what we actually need for our own people, because what you do in Southern Ontario might be quite different from what they do in Northern Ontario or you know whatever area of Ontario you're living in. Because this way, if you have treaty implementation, 
you then reverse what's going on over here and you build up back the treaty relationship. Because that's what's missing in this, in this process because in this process, you have a resource revenue, stream of resource revenue that comes from the territory. And so that means you are able to survive as we always used to survive in our territories, from our own wealth in our territories. Now, how do you get this implemented? I have been working at the United Nations for years, as a lot of people may know that. I was just there last week. I'm going to talk about Geneva. And one of the things that we've been pushing is that we need international supervision to oversee these kinds of negotiations. Because we need to keep these guys' feet to the fire. Because what they, don't, what they don't want to do is they don't want to share. Even though we shared our territory with the Crown and their subjects, they don't want to share with us. And the only way we're going to do that is if we, push, we force them to do it. And the way we force them to do it is we get the United Nations on our side. Now, the United Nations has been coming onto our side. There's, a special, there's an independent expert who's planning to come to a meeting in Onion Lake in July, mid-July, because we want to talk about this with him, as to how we can make this happen. Because if we don't do this, they're going to pass that legislation. And it's, very, it's a very easy legislation to pass, because this already is an act of parliament. This is a statute of Canada. Don't want to get into the big gory details of all this, but and the statute of Canada is already a law in Canada. To make it apply nationally, all they have to do is remove in British Columbia. So all they do is say in Parliament, statute of Canada, chapter 10, is amended by removing the words in British Columbia. So then this would read First Nation jurisdiction over, let me just read you the real title, an act to provide for jurisdiction over education on First Nation lands period. And this thing will apply across the country. You know, so Tim was talking, you know, Tim, Tim Thompson was talking about the timeline. He's saying, oh, it's a very tight timeline. I don't know how they're going to be able to do it. They'll need to have the bill in by September the 4th. The September, well, they want it in place by September 2014. So they're going to have to have the bill passed by 2014, spring of 2014 which means it's got to be introduced by the fall of 2013, which is this fall. So he doesn't know how it's going to be done. I'm, I'm just telling you how it's going to be done. It's a simple amendment. That's all it is. And the whole thing applies across the country. And I think that's what they were trying to do at the meeting in October. I think that this amendment was in C45 because they made major changes to the Indian Act in C45. I don't know if you're familiar with what happened in C45. People talk about the lands and the waters and stuff like that. But they also changed C45, changed the voting on reserves. So if you want to surrender land on the reserve, it used to be the majority of the voters. So you have 1,000 people vote, eligible to vote, say, for example. You needed 501 people to agree to surrender the land. In, in, in Bill 45, they changed that now. It's only the majority of the people who show up to vote. So this could be a majority of the people that showed up to vote. Could be. The minister can call the meeting for the purposes of surrender. He doesn't need to tell the chief and council. And he doesn't even need to hold it in your community. Right? And I think at the same time in C45, they wanted to, to change the education. But they couldn't get the resolution through the chief's meeting in, in Gatineau.
Because if anybody remembers, the Minister of Indian Affairs was livid. I mean, I'd never seen Duncan get livid about anything, you know. Usually just like that. <laughs> but he was upset, you know. And I was thinking, why is this guy upset? There's a reason why this guy's upset. And to my, when I thought about it, I thought it's because they had something in mind and they didn't get the approval. And they were afraid to try to move it without that. So I think everything is ready, but we need to plan our own attack, so to speak. How are we going to do this? And you need to be aware, like, a lot of the First Nations I work with have taken their school boards, their school boards, and stripped them of the authority to sign agreements on behalf of the school board without the authority, without the overriding authority of the nation. So all the agreements now for the schools come back through the, through the, through the, through the chief and council. Uh, they flow, th the monies flow through to the schools, but the, the school board does not sign any agreements. No, there's no provincial uh, agreements between the province and the school boards. It's the province and the, and the chief and council because the Chief and Council monitor those agreements. So you need, to, you need to start looking at the nuts and bolts of what's going on, because if you read these agreements, and I have in great detail, some more detail than I wanted to. I, I said at a workshop somewhere, I don't know if anybody's seen the videotape, but I, I, did, I did a workshop one time and I was talking about reading these agreements in the middle of the night. Um, because, you know, sometimes you're sound asleep and something wakes you up and you think, geez, I've got to look at that. So I get up and I leave these contribution agreements. But in there, these contribution agreements have all kinds of criteria. Like, for example, in the contribution agreements, it says that non-Indians non can go, can receive programs and services. Right? I don't know if people are familiar with that. Non-Indians can receive programs and services. But if you look at the legislation that they're trying to pass through Ottawa right now on matrimonial real property, it says that non-Indians can, through the courts, acquire interests in houses and lands on the reserves. So if a non-Indian acquires an interest on Indian lands, reserved lands, that means they can also sell that interest. So it, if you can sell the interest in the lands and you do sell the interest in the lands and the lands disappear, the government, doesn't, the government says, well, we didn't take the lands from the Indians, they lost it. And this is what happened to the Maori in New Zealand. You know, the, everybody talks about the Maori and the language and the Kongorias and the, and the language nests and stuff like that. But if you go there, the Maori don't have land anymore. They have marais, there were one or two acres that they can have ceremonies for, but they can't live there. And so the Maori are spread amongst the population of the non-Maori non people, and they're, the only thing they could hang on to, to say they're still Maori, is a language. But they're not on the land. We're still on the land, but they want us off the land. So I think we always have to be aware of what is the, what's the objective of this body over here and how they're using their own system to bring us over. And it's not like it's not happening like this overnight. It's a slow, gradual process because in 69, this is where they've always wanted to go. Now, while the, the bureaucrats have been very step by step by step, we have not step-by-step step implemented what we considered was Indian control of Indian education. We didn't. We let them somehow grab a hold of the agenda. And as they grab the hold of the agenda, in the future, who's losing out on this is going to be our children. You know, so uh, we need to really rethink this. And I think looking at another model of how to do things is, is really the direction to go in.